Thank you. It's a tremendous honor to be here with all of you this afternoon. Uh, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about this project, two projects that I've been working on, both at Mary Technology and Art. And the second one will be super relevant uh, when we get to it, the uh, piece inspired by the Hubble Telescope. If you'll indulge me, I'd like to just take a few minutes and tell you how it is that I came to be a classical musician, which is what I am now. Uh, I grew up a space nerd. I, um, I was a child in northern Nevada. I had my first reflector telescope when I was 10 years old. I'd go out at night, stare into the stars. I honestly thought I was going to be an astronaut. Uh, then I discovered computers, and I learned to program basic language on Commodore 64s. This is back in the mid-'80s. Any Commodore 64 fans, yeah, remember, still a great computer. I still have mine. <laughs> and computers led me to computer music, which led me to Depeche Mode, and that was it. <laughs> yeah. So I spent most of my high school uh, trying to become the fifth member of Depeche Mode. Uh, I suppose if I'm honest, I'd still like to be the fifth member of Depeche Mode. Uh, at 18, I went to university. I went to a school at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. It was the, the biggest state school furthest from my parents, I suppose. And uh, while there, uh, the conductor of the choir heard me auditioning for a different scholarship. I was playing on piano, and he said, why don't you come sing in the choir? And I remember thinking, there's no way I'm going to join the choir. I mean, I, I may be a nerd, but I'm not a geek. And, <laughs> and uh, I decided to join just because I didn't know anybody, and I thought, okay, it might, it might be a great place to meet people. And the, the very first day, some of you are musicians. Are, have any of you sung in a choir before? Yeah, so you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Basically, you come in and you start with massages with each other, and then <laughs> these warm-ups, and I've never been more embarrassed for humanity in my entire life. <laughs> I, and, and the conductor said, okay, let's turn to the curie. Uh, I was raised without religion. I had no idea even what a curie was. So I remember looking over my shoulder, okay, page 10. And then he stood up on the podium, raised his hands, and then oh, boom. And we launched into the curie from the Requiem by Mozart. And any of you who have sung this know that it starts with us, starts with the basses. We start, Kyrie, le. then the altos, sopranos, tenors, and within 25 seconds, I found myself standing in the middle of this cosmic Swiss watch, this level of complexity and beauty that until that moment I couldn't have imagined existed. And I remember standing there, not singing, just trembling like this. And then I did what I still do when I hear music that moves me, I giggled. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally I had tears in my eyes and I realized that for the first time in my life, I felt part of something larger than myself. And I left that room utterly transformed, as if my entire life I'd been seen in black and white, and the world was now in shocking technicolor. And I joined every choir I could. I became the world's biggest choir geek, uh, even president of the choir social club. And three years into my seven-year undergraduate degree, I, um, I wrote my very first piece of music, just a humble gift to, for this conductor who had changed my life. And we read through it, and hearing my mind and blood and breath in the bodies of, of other people, their minds, their blood, their breath. I knew that was it. This is my vocation. I don't know how I'll do it, but I'll figure out a way to become a composer. And so for the past uh, 25 years, I ended up going to the Juilliard School to get my master's degree. But over the past 25 years, this is what I do. I work with choirs and orchestras, and I, I travel to them, conduct them, make music, and compose for them. It's a strange job being a composer because uh, the, the piece, it, once it's finished, it gets published in sheet music and it goes out into the world and you never know the impact that it's going to have on people out there unless you happen to be at the performance. And this model has been like this for the past four or five hundred years. It's only with the advent of social media that composers for the first time could get feedback from people who were actually affected by the music. So eight years ago, a friend of mine sent me a link to a YouTube video and he said, you have got to see this. And in it was this young woman named Brittlin Losi, only 17 at the time, uh, from Long Island. And she had uploaded a fan video to me. She pushed play on a piece that I'd written, and she was singing the top line, the soprano line, over it. And she didn't know me. She didn't know if it would make it to me. But somehow, like this electronic message in a bottle, it did. It found me. Here's a little bit of Brittlin's video. Hi, Mr. Eric Whitaker. Um, my name is Brittlin Losi, and this is a video that I'd like to make for you. Here's me singing to sleep. I'm a little nervous. Just... 
just let you know. I thought Britland's video was one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. It's just completely pure and innocent. The intention is, it's so singular. And I remember watching it and getting tears in my eyes and think, by the way, I, I don't cry all the time. I just realized it's the only two times I've ever cried. I don't know why I'm sharing it. It's very emotional this afternoon. Anyway, I got tears in my eyes, and I remember watching uh, Britlin's video and thinking, if I could somehow get 25 people to do what Britlin is doing, if they sat alone in their dorm rooms or their living rooms or their garages in front of a computer and sang their part, soprano, alto, tenor, or bass, as long as they were singing at the same tempo, same speed, and in the same key, if I just literally took all the videos and started them at the same time, this choir would unfold, this virtual choir. So the first challenge was, how do you get them all to sing at the same speed? So I came up with this. Uh, this is for a piece that I'd written called Lux Aurumque, which in Latin simply means light and gold. And I offered the music free for download so that singers could download it. And then they sit in front of their computer and watch this, this conductor video that I made. And you can hear there's no sound to it it's because there's no choir yet. I'm just standing there imagining the perfect performance in my head, this choir that will eventually come to be. I can tell you that that day in the studio, people thought I was out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and I really didn't know if anybody would do this. Uh, um, I, I had never tried it before. I didn't know if singers would join. I, I posted on my blog and on Facebook, I said, okay, gang, let's try this thing. And lo and behold, singers started uploading their videos. So this is Cheryl Ang from Singapore, one of the videos that, that came up. Evangelina Etienne from Massachusetts. Stephen Hansen from Sweden. And Jamal Walker from Texas. There's even a short soprano solo at the beginning. So 30 or 40 sopranos uploaded their videos. And I chose Melody Myers from Tennessee. I don't know if you can read the top comment. It says, you melt my face off. <laughs> <laughs> you too. The poetry of our time. I'm all told we had 185 different videos from 12 different countries. Uh, and I know nothing about video editing. Nothing at all. I, I hadn't thought this far along in the process. I'm going to get all these videos uploaded to me. I didn't know what to do. Uh, I blogged about this, and this young man named Scott Haynes, who was 21 at the time, reached out to me and said, this is the project I've been looking for my whole life. <coughs> I wrote back to Scott and said, Scott, thank God you found me. <laughs> Scott spent about three months uh, organizing the videos, making a beautiful, uh, a beautiful choir, the image of a choir. But more, more, more importantly, he spent the time cleaning the sound. So you could hear even in those few videos that I played you, you can hear you know, air conditioning in the background or computer fan noise. Uh, that stuff is relatively easy to get rid of with EQ and compression. In some of the videos though, there were ambulances in the background, there were crickets. Uh, we had one video uploaded where you could hear a kid's mother yelling at him off screen. <laughs> so all that has to be very carefully mixed. And in, uh, I guess this would have been uh, nearly eight years ago, we uploaded to YouTube Virtual Choir 1.0, Luke's Outroom Choir.
forgive me. I'll stop it here just in the interest of time. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. What's the link in Slack so you can review it? Uh, we really thought that only uh, our little band of choir geeks would be interested in anything like this, but the video went viral. We had a couple million, million hits in the first few days, and then it got picked up by the national news media. And suddenly singers from all over the world were writing to me on my blog and Facebook and saying, this is amazing. I have to be a part of this. When is the next virtual choir? <laughs> I hadn't planned on the next virtual <laughs> choir at all. So we, we learned from our, our mistakes. Uh, th this time, and we, we, we made a much more robust system that would handle more videos coming in. We started developing educational tools for people that did, had never sung before, couldn't read music, these online educational tools. And a year and a half after the first one, we launched Virtual Choir 2.0, this time to a piece I'd written called Sleep. <laughs> This time, 2,052 different singers from 58 countries. And the countries, the list was amazing, uh, as disparate as Iran, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Palestine, Jordan, Egypt, Israel, southern countries on the African continent, as far north as the great Alaskan bush, and as far south as New Zealand. Almost overnight, our little choir experiment had become a global choir and still singers were writing in when is the next one i missed the last one we have to do this so a year and a half after that one, we we launched a virtual choir 3.0 water night <laughs> This time, nearly 4,000 singers from 73 different countries. We started hearing all these amazing stories from people, how they'd come to find the virtual choir, what it took to become a part of it. And so we set up a testimonial page on my website where people could come and write about it. And the stories were extraordinary. There was uh, a man who had sung as a as a young man and had gone legally blind and for the past 30 years hadn't been able to sing in a choir because he couldn't see the conductor. And now for the first time he could get close enough to my to the computer screen and see my little video, he joined the choir. There was a young woman who had sung with her mother uh, since she was just a, a very small child in choirs. It was a thing they did together. Her mother was dying of cancer. And so she recorded her video while her mother was in hospice holding her hand just off screen as a tribute to her. There was a man from Cuba who desperately wanted to be part of the virtual choir, but because of government regulations, was unable to send a file larger than one meg. So we got our tech people together with him, taught him how to cut it up into 26 little pieces. He sent them all to us. We stitched it all back together. Cuba became part of the virtual choir. Through all of it, we've held true to, to only two credos. The first is that we do not want to make any money from it. You can imagine the the implications, the corporate implications, right? And the, the message that it sends. We've been approached by all kinds of corporations and pop stars. Uh, for us, we wanna keep it beautiful, just pure, the, the way that it started. And the second is that every single person gets in. No one is ever turned away. Uh, one of the beautiful things about singing is that it scales very nicely. If you've ever been in a football stadium with 60,000 drunk people, <laughs> sounds okay, you know, it's not so bad. <laughs> Something about singing really smooths out the rough edges. I get asked all the time, why don't I do a virtual orchestra? And I try to explain, oboes do not scale nicely. <laughs> so the, the, we, we've held fast to those two credos. Uh, so far, we've done seven virtual choir projects, over 20,000 singers from 110 different countries through those projects. Three years ago, Chris Anderson from the TED conference uh, called me up and said, is it possible to do a live virtual choir? And by that he meant, could I stand on stage and then have singers from around the world beaming in in real time following me? And could we make a choir? I said, yes, it's absolutely possible. It's not possible. <laughs> it's not even close. I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, we partnered with Skype and we, uh, we put in 30 different singers in 30 countries. They each had their own dedicated server, their own tech person at Skype handling just them. 
The problem was, and this especially three years ago, was at some point you run into the physical limitations of the speed of light, right? It's, it, if it's halfway around the world, you're, there's still going to be a few milliseconds delay by the time it gets to here and gets back to them. A few milliseconds for some applications isn't a big deal at all, but in music, milliseconds are a lifetime, and we just couldn't keep everybody together. So I turned a bug into a feature and wrote a piece where they wouldn't have to sing at the same speed. They could sing their little part, but sing over and over at their own speed. And then I had them all snapping their fingers. It was a piece called Cloud Burst to kind of simulate the sound of rain. Here's a little bit from that. Let's see. And I even have the audience snapping their fingers. For me, this is the height of the aesthetic experience, is that uh, the audience, the performers, the conductor, the composer, everybody is working together, a true communal experience, to create something larger than themselves. And that leads me to the next project, which finally, for you, has some relevance in this room, uh, Deep Field. So, uh, yeah, I, I remember when the Hubble Space Telescope was launched. It was one of the great moments in my life. I couldn't wait. You all remember, right, that it was they've been promising for 15 years that it was going to have views further into space than anything we'd ever seen before. Also, at the time, it was called the, the most complex machine ever built by man. It cost billions and billions of dollars. Uh, and it was an achievement just getting it up. But it... Some of you may recall that, that when they got it up, they started bringing back the first images and analyze the data, it was corrupted. There was something wrong, it was blurry. Um, and uh, I guess apparently there was a problem with the, there was a an spherical aberration on the mirror, the largest mirror ever built at that time, and now it's in space. So it's not like you can just go up and swap the thing out. And NASA, uh, Congress did what they always do. They called for NASA's dissolution. They called it a boondoggle and a techno turkey. NASA did what NASA always did. They just rolled up their sleeves and got to work figuring out how to fix this thing. They sent up four shuttle missions. Uh, last one was led by Dr. John Grunsfeld here, uh, who I've had the great pleasure of spending some time with. One of the most brilliant and empathetic men I've ever met. And they realized that, that the data, while corrupted, was consistently corrupted. So basically what they did is they just found a huge piece of hardware, glass, chiseled it to exactly the right dimensions, stuck in front of the, the lens for all practical purposes, and basically put a contact lens on the Hubble telescope. So only NASA can think of things like this. Uh, and when, when the telescope was finally operational, it started bringing back some of these images. The M101, the Orion Nebula, one of my favorites, the Sombrero Galaxy. Absolutely extraordinary. And then in 1995, once the thing was working and going, Bob Williams, who at the time was the, the head of the, uh, the Hubble team, decided against better wishes from the rest of the team to point the telescope at a completely black area of the sky. Did, did any of you work on this project? I'm just, it just now occurring, I'm telling the story to people who <laughs> may actually have been involved with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, <laughs> so forgive me. Um, uh, anyway, it pointed the telescope at a complete blank area of the sky. The, to earthbound telescopes, there was simply nothing there. Uh, for me, in layman's terms, I've heard the, I, I don't remember what the arc degrees are, but it's like holding a penny at arm's length and looking through Lincoln's eye. That's the size of sky that it was pointed at. And they left it open, the, 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 they took in light for almost 11 days, 385 separate exposures. 
And when it finally came back and was analyzed, it was this, the deep field image. This is actually the ultra deep field image, but it's, it's quite similar to the original deep field. Over 3,000 objects in this tiny sliver of the sky, only a few of them uh, local objects in our own galaxy. The rest of them galaxies, right? Each one of them representing hundreds of billions, possibly trillions of stars. To me, this is the most important image in human history because it shows us how impossibly vast our universe is and how truly, truly small we are in it. So I wanted to write a piece about it. And I wanted to write an immersive piece, a piece that somehow would have audiences feeling the same sense of wonder and awe that I felt looking at that image and knowing the story. So how does one write a piece like that? You know, you start to write a few notes down and you, <laughs> well, yeah, I'll just write a piece about the observable observable universe, what could go wrong? Uh, it's, it's easy to get stuck in the weeds very quickly. Uh, my son is here with me today. He's 12 now, but when he was five, we were living in London at the time, and we were stuck inside on a rainy Saturday, and we drew some pictures, and Esh drew this. Uh, you can see it's my name here, Eric. And then when he finished, I asked him, what are these things here around the side? And so he explained to me, this is a rainbow skull and crossbones, up top, <laughs> then a giant pyramid of cheese, then this is a rain cloud falling on Zeus, who is shooting lightning bolts down on a snake wearing pants, <laughs> and then finally an alien baby playing maracas and hot dogs. <laughs> all of you who have kids know this is the kind of acid trip thing they say all the time. I don't know where this comes from. But what I was struck by more than the creativity was how unironic he was about it. He said, yeah, that's a snake wearing pants, right? There was just not jaded at all. That's what I meant. That's what, it, and I realized at the moment that really what he's doing is just learning, right? He's learning about imagination and eye hand coordination and color and balance. And what did we do? Uh, as parents, we gave him a big hug. We put up the, his picture on the refrigerator. Uh, we really rewarded him for it. I found that, that around about his age now, 12, 13, 14 years old, is when the, the way we teach, it starts to become there's a right way and there's a wrong way. So the, the explorationists and especially the autodidacticism of, in terms of a learning process, that's gone. And by the time you're 18 or 19, you've been taught over and over and over. You get it wrong, you get it wrong, you get it wrong. Picasso very famously said, all children are born artists and only the lucky few survive into adulthood. I truly, truly, truly believe that. So I started doing the same thing. This is a piece that I wrote called Equus, which in Latin simply means horse. And I sat down, no judgment at all, just started writing whatever I could. I started with this Death Star Pokemon ball here in the middle. Uh, and then I, I started writing descriptive words about the piece. This is before I'd written a note of music. So strong, delicate, exciting, awe-inspiring. Uh, I played number games here, a little Fibonacci sequence stuff, just to keep my hand moving if, if I started to run out of ideas. And then at the very top here in the left-hand corner, I wrote down the first notes that came into my head. I didn't do what I usually do, which is think that's terrible, it makes no sense, doesn't sound like a horse, Stravinsky could have done it better. I would have studied harder, I could have been an architect and had a real job. I didn't think any of those things. I just went with it. Um, I've had the great pleasure now of working on three film scores with the film composer Hans Zimmer. And Hans has this great motto, which is why go with your fifth bad idea when you can go with your first bad idea. <laughs> so when I started to map out Deep Field, I did the same thing. I sat down with a piece of graph paper and I started to say, what is the, the the experience that I want the audience to have? What is the journey that I want to take them on? By now, I've kind of refined this process to something I call emotional architecture. And so basically, I knew that it would start in mud, static, and then would, there would be this first, these plateaus. Basically, my idea was that the music would be out of focus, sound out of focus, then would flirt with being in focus, then be out of focus, a little more in focus, then finally, at the moment, when it comes into focus, you hear this massive chord from the orchestra. You can feel that it's in focus. This, and I wrote down, reached out and touched the face of God. I'm not a religious person. It's, from, it's a line from a poem called High Flight. Any of you know, it's so beautiful. And it, mostly what I wanted is just that sense of wonder and fear and awe that comes with seeing that thing in focus. So I started that way. 
And really what I'm doing when, when I start sketching like this is I'm looking for what I call the golden brick. For me, the golden brick is a musical idea that carries all of the DNA for building an entire piece in it. Uh, the, the most famous golden brick in all of classical music is only four notes. Ba -ba -ba -bum, right? That's it, four notes, and he built four movements of an entire symphony off those four notes, used them in endlessly inventive ways on the macro level and on the micro level. Uh, here's a famous one that Bach used. Bach used this motive uh, over a dozen times. Why? Spells his name. <laughs> Be natural is H in German. Uh, I tried something similar when I first began composing. This is a piece I wrote called Ghost Train. This is the opening flute solo. That is my ex-girlfriend's phone number. <laughs> I wish I was kidding. Uh, if any of you are from Texas, or you'll recognize the 817 area code, 1817, right? Uh, yeah, she was, she was at Baylor, so she was at Waco. And, uh, uh, but what I did is, I just in case somebody cracked the code and I didn't want anybody prank calling her. I left the last number of her phone phone number off, right? And only years later did I realize, well, there's only 10 possibilities. <laughs> so, sorry, Kimberly. Uh, but, but the idea with the golden brick is that, that the golden brick is, should, should be efficient, meaning that it should work on multiple levels at the same time, delivering all kinds of information. One of my favorite from the past 20 years, I have to say, is from arguably the catchiest song ever written, Let It Go, from Frozen. <laughs> Again, any of you who have children, you know this song way, way too well. I'm sorry for sticking in your head right now. But built into the piece, it, it's incredibly architecture of it. So if you start with a C and you take the highest note in each of these, let it go, let it go, can't hold it back anymore. Let it go, let it go, turn away and slam the door, then finally, I don't care. And what they done is you see the hero's journey, the struggle up the mountaintop, Elsa's journey. And then when she finally gets to the point of the entire movie, I don't care when she lets it go, that's when we reach the mountaintop. It's brilliant how good that, and I think it, it's a big reason that it's so damn catchy. Um, so I tried to do the same thing when I was riding Deep Field. And I started with this basic shape. And the idea was that, that I would tell NASA's story in this little golden brick. So we start with three notes. Um, um, um. Very simple. And that to me is that initial failure. You get it up and then this falling motive, right? Then the aspirational motive. Um, um, um. Reaching. Also, it sounded in my ear just a little bit like Blade Runner, the original Blade Runner. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, yep, we're, on the, we're in the right DNA world here. Then finally the struggle, the same thing. Reaching the plateau, and just note this blue line. We'll talk about this in a minute. And then finally, the catharsis. Bum, bum, bum. The exact same notes as the failure, but now transformed by the journey. So this was, this was just this very simple motive that then became the governing principle for every note in the piece, including the structure itself. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, let's see. This. Yeah, so here's from early on in the piece. You'll hear the oboes playing. So they're playing that aspirational theme. Bum, bum, bum. But it's broken up between two oboes, right? So it's out of focus. Behind them, now you hear. But it's many flutes and clarinets all playing out of tempo. So the music itself is out of focus. Super simple. And also you hear how slowly all of it moves. That's very intentional, just trying to somehow express the, the magnitude of the thing that we're talking about here, just in terms of time and space. Then I start to build the structure. I know the emotional journey that I want to take, but within this also needs to be something that, that truly unifies it. I do this with every piece that I write. But for this one, because we were talking about uh, the deep field image, I chose the Fibonacci sequence. Sure, you all remember this, but just in case, one plus one equals two, one plus two equals three, two plus three equals five, so on. And if you take any two numbers in the sequence, say 34 and 55, the ratio is approximately one to 1.618, what we call phi, right? And phi when graphed looks like this. And we see this 
shape in, in nature. Uh, and we see that the numbers sequence all the time in, in plant life, uh, in numbers of pine cone seeds. It's a brilliant, uh, simple way of, of expressing this, this recurring pattern in nature. And architects and artists have been using this same principle for millennia. This beautiful staircase, the Parthenon. The Greeks were huge proponents of the, of the golden mean here and of using these for balanced symmetry, the Mona Lisa. Apple's a bit obsessed with this. This is the original iPhone, but the new iPhones have exactly the same proportions. The iCloud logo. The most recent iteration of the logo is a wonder <laughs> of <laughs> the stores themselves are even based on the same principle, the, 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 where the doors are, where the way the tables are laid out. This is the piece Lux Arumque that we did with the first virtual choir. And what I did is there's a natural break in the music, a silence. And very intentionally, when I built that piece, I designed it like this. Now, why do this? I don't think for a minute that people sit in an audience and listen to music and think, what a, yeah, what a wonderful use of the Fibonacci sequence. I, <laughs> no, I don't. But what I actually think is happening is in, just in terms of beauty itself, I think there's a pattern seeking part of the brain that is somehow aware of this. It can feel the, this, this tight organization, this governing principle in this, the signal in the noise. And the only way really to communicate it I think to our conscious brain is feeling, is emotion. We just have a sense that it works. I know pieces that, for me, are pieces of music that are constructed like this. By the way, almost all pop songs are constructed with this. You've usually got a verse, a hook, a verse, a hook, the B section, the bridge, what they call, and then a double hook at the end. And if you start the bridge right there, it's almost always exactly at the golden mean. It just feels right to us. So when I built my, when I was constructing this, uh, my little golden brick. The top phrase here happens right at the golden mean so that I keep that ratio. And then that's on the micro level. At the macro level, it does exactly the same thing. The piece itself actually does this. And now finally, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to play for you just a couple clips of the end of, of the piece of Deep Field. This piece that I'll play you now is, is the part we're approaching the moment where it all comes into focus. And you'll hear instruments slowly, slowly go into unison so that ultimately they're all on the same note, holding, holding here. And then finally, it comes into full relief with this huge chord. You'll know when we've arrived because I'm conducting and you'll be able to see it on my face. <laughs> I get embarrassed every time I do this, but I, I, the only thing I can tell you is if, you're, if you ever get the chance to stand in front of an 85 piece orchestra and have this rumble, I, I, it was actually moving my clothes, it was so loud. I was shaking on the, Anyway, you'll see it all in my face. Please do it. It's, it's one of the great experiences. <laughs> And forgive me, 
I'll stop it here. Uh, yeah, I think I actually did blow up the speakers. I'm so sorry about that. Whoever does that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So finally, then, as as a way to to somehow get the audience feeling like they're part of this this true immersive experience, I was sitting while I was composing. I was sitting uh, at another concert, and they, did, and they started the classical concerts the way they do all classical concerts, which is an announcement saying, "Please turn off your cell phones." And I guess I just had to say, you know, response to authority and and uh, question everything I hear. And I thought, why are we turning off our phones? I mean, I get it. You know, you don't want the sound happening during this, but. Really, what you're asking people to do is silence 2,000 video players. People are bringing their own video players to this show, and we're telling them to just keep them in their pockets. So my idea was that after this huge climax, we'd come down like this. I would turn to the audience, and I would simply do this. And they will have downloaded an app with a, that's getting ready for us with a huge play button on it, just waiting. And everybody pushes play at the same time. And then what will happen is uh, you'll, there will be a 3D fly-through through space. Uh, Frank would be the first to agree it's not accurate in terms of time scale, but we go <laughs> sipping over galaxies and, and then finally the deep field image is revealed. And so more importantly than the, the video is from each cell phone is emanating a little shimmering electronic sound, which on its own is not that interesting. But if you have 2,000 or 3,000 or 5,000 phones all making the sound at the same time, Suddenly, you really feel like you're swimming in space. I'll, I'll play a little bit from it now. I'm not sure if the speakers will be able to. sound in the background, that's those thousands of cell phones all making this noise. And then they're surrounded by choirs, the audiences. And we hear for the very first time the entire golden brick, that theme, now in focus, completely out of gold. So then as a coda to all of this, uh, the reason uh, that I'm here today is because I've had the extraordinary pleasure of meeting Frank and Kim and spending a lot of time with them. Uh, both have been intimately involved in this next stage of the virtual choir. What we, what we decided for virtual choir five is that we're going to have deep field be our piece and that we're going to have thousands and thousands of singers singing these little micro cells, this little golden brick. We'll upload it uh, and then ultimately, not only will there be a film, something you can watch on YouTube, also projected live, but uh, when you push play on your phone, what you will have done each time you open the app, it will just randomly download a voice from somewhere in the world. And so suddenly we'll create a virtual choir live on people's phones in the space as it's happening. Uh, we realized early on that we had the opportunity to educate a little bit with the virtual choir project. People would come, spend a lot of time on the site. We started you know, teaching them basic musicianship and basic conducting classical music, structure, these kinds of things. But with, with Deep Field, we realized we have the opportunity to, to really do something different. When you sign up, then, uh, not only are you coming in to, 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 uh, to record your videos, 
but there's now these badges, 18 badges that you can earn. And each one of them is somehow based with in, in the STEAM uh, system over here, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And each of the little challenges uh, has its own little thing. So cosmic distance, this is one that Kim, you created this one, yeah, Kim? It's beautiful. So it teaches people just, just the very basics about how, how small and how large things are in the universe. Once they've completed it and they answer the right questions, then they get this little badge. Frank, this is one of yours, I think. Yeah, <laughs> there's Frank. Uh, um, and you watch the video and then ask, answer some questions and you earn the badge. Not the best shot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who that's for you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, you look like you're giving me a uh, like Darth Vader death grip, like <laughs> the galaxy. Um, but, but, but so far, uh, we, we launched just a couple of days ago. The, the virtual choir. And we can see behind the scenes how many people have signed up. We've had about 15,000 signups now. And we've had nearly 5,000 people complete all 18 badges. So whether they knew it or not, people are starting to learn a little bit about science and space and technology. My goal, hopefully, is it's just a tiny drop in the water, not only in terms of science uh, and technology and engineering and mathematics and arts in terms of education, but also that hopefully it just starts to point slowly back to a world of critical thinking, fact-based thinking. It, uh, yeah, I mean, we laugh, but it's, it's a strange time, isn't it? Um, and, and anyway, so uh, that's, that's what I've been working on, and thank you so much for your time.